Благодать вам и мир от Бога Отца нашего и Господа Иисуса Христа. I just said in Russian, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the Feast of Pentecost, and if you did not understand what I originally said in Russian, then you probably do not have the special gift of tongues or interpretation of tongues. Well, I do not have this particular gift either. However, I have a much greater gift as a called and ordained servant of the church, gift of communication of the Spirit to you through the words that go from my mouth in this public sermon. This is none of my merit. This is just what Jesus promised to his disciples, and so he fulfilled his promise. The promises of Jesus always come true. Always. Some time ago, my colleague at our seminary in Novosibirsk, in faraway Siberia, observed some questionable Facebook post from one of the prominent confessional Lutheran seminaries here in America. I wouldn't name the seminary to not make anybody embarrassed. Featured was a painting of a 17th century artist from the Netherlands. In the picture, there was depicted a service at the church, the people listening to a preacher from the pulpit, while the Holy Spirit as a dove was coming to their hearts and minds from the heavens. The problem my colleague had with this representation of the action of the Holy Spirit was discrepancy, disjunction between the preaching of the word and the coming of the Spirit, as though these were two separate activities. According to our Lutheran confession, the Holy Spirit does not come other than through the preached word of the gospel. The Lutherans are not enthusiasts. And so we believe that since Jesus promised to send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, from the Father, this is exactly what he is doing. The Spirit does not just fall from the sky. No, the Spirit comes from Jesus. The Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And Jesus said of himself that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he also said that his words are spirit and truth. So when I speak from this pulpit, in the stand and by the command of Jesus, then I speak the words of the Spirit. I may sound awkward, with a strange accent, but for the ways of the Spirit, it doesn't matter. If you hear and understand what I say, you hear the voice of the Spirit, here and now. Many people today look for the voice of the Spirit in some strange places. They seek special spirituality, something in the abstract, yet the Spirit is no abstract. The Spirit is concrete, specific, creator and sanctifier. Yet, alas, many people stumble on the spiritual issues. Some approach the question of things spiritual in a very formalistic way. They see Christianity as a system of rules one has to follow in order to secure the right relationships with God, resulting in the bright future devoid of any trouble. This is how it might look. People think that they must go to church, pay the tribute, by way of attending the divine service, receive the sacrament, go through the motions, so that by way of simply obeying such rules, they may demonstrate their external commitment to faith. And so the church becomes a little more than boring, tedious, but somehow needed exercise to go through. Those of us who are this way may try to stay alert for a little while, wake up early in the morning, come to church, struggle through whatever happens there. And then people think, God is pleased with them, and so they can go out and do some really exciting things out in the world. Then it's okay to live for the rest of the week without occupying your mind with commandments, prayers, and the like. In a view like this, the role of the Holy Spirit is negligent at best. Other people, on the contrary, are inclined toward spiritual extremism. For example, they understand the Spirit as a 
kind of force or power, power that would throw you on your bottoms and make you super energetic and happy for a while, perhaps make you pronounce some indistinguishable sounds and fall into ecstasy. It's like a drug with the same name, ecstasy, or some other pill people take to stay active in a nightclub. So if spirit were a force, then it would have been very easy to spot who has the spirit and who has not. People like us here are not the likely candidates in this scenario for the spiritual people. However, St. Paul admonished the very spiritual Corinthians that the power of God gets known in weakness. While celebrating the feast of descent of the Holy Spirit, it is worth remembering that the Spirit comes to highlight Christ and his work on the cross. While celebrating descent of the Spirit, we still preach Christ crucified, precisely because it was on the cross that Christ gave up the Spirit. It is in the moment of extreme humiliation and shame of the cross that the true spiritual power and glory shines forth. So it is this very spirit that comes from the cross along with the water and the blood flowing from the side of Jesus hanging on the cross that we celebrate today. Let us see what Jesus says in the gospel text. In one of his speeches about the advocate or helper, Jesus promises to his disciples to send the Holy Spirit. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Descent of the Holy Spirit and Pentecost in the wind and flames is indeed the coming of the promised helper. It is not just that a certain individual or a certain group of people was filled with the Holy Spirit for their personal benefit, but rather all this happened for the sake of the preaching of the word of God to establish the holy and apostolic Christian church on earth. How does Jesus begin today's passage? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And just the opposite. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You may say all you want that you love God, but if you do not abide by his word in your faith and your life, then it is just an illusion, a fiction. Some people say thus, it does not matter that we believe different. What matters is that we love God and one another. Well, it actually matters. Christ considers it crucial. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Note that the word here is in the singular. This word encompasses all that Jesus has left for us. And this word belongs to the Father who sent his only begotten Son, his Logos, his word, to the world to come in our flesh and be our Savior. Jesus communicates this word to his disciples by sending the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit says nothing new. The Spirit reminds to the disciples all that Jesus said. This is precisely the meaning of tradition and succession of the church, to remind all what Jesus said and to transmit his uncorrupted doctrine from one generation to another. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give to you. What is the kind of peace that the world gives? Some people may be tempted to think that they would get peace by changing their mind through some narcotic effects. That peace, however, wouldn't last long. It would eventually result even in even greater depression. Others desperately try to obtain peace in a sense of security, that a sizable bank account or investments or real estate or anything else of this material nature would provide. Well, through the time of an economic crisis, God 
teaches us that we are not to rely on any temporary riches of this world because all of this shall eventually pass. There is nothing secure in this world. Today, we may have two or three cars for a family. Tomorrow, we wonder if we are able to fill our car tank, given the gas prices at the pump. For example, coming here, I was quite surprised seeing different figures, even compared to my last visit last year. Today, we are content with our children growing up to move to successful career. Tomorrow, we deal with them being laid off at their jobs or having to come back to their parents' house. This world just cannot provide the peace that would last in our lifetime. The peace that Jesus is speaking about is of a different nature. This is the peace with God. The true peace comes about when the Father and the Son are coming to us and making their home with us. And this home begins here in the church. Those claiming to be in direct control of the Spirit and in direct contact with the Spirit are victims of the illusion. And they are on a very dangerous path. They don't know what they are doing and what they are talking about. We confess the word that Jesus gave us through the apostolic scriptures. And so we confess that the Holy Spirit is given through the acts of the church, such as baptism, absolution, and the Lord's Supper. The Holy Spirit is then recognized once we yield the spiritual fruit in our lives. It is important to understand or make any judgments about spiritual life before you begin to live the actual spiritual life. That is the life of the Spirit. It is also what we call sanctification. Martin Luther considers all the acts of God in his church to be the acts of the Spirit. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. Thus, whatever God does, he does by the power of the Holy Spirit. And since the Spirit is the Spirit of the truth, and he testifies about Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, it is in our praise and worship of Jesus that the Holy Spirit fulfills this promised work. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. How does the Spirit do this teaching? Through the ministers of God, through the called and ordained servants of the church. In the Gospel of John, Jesus gives the Spirit to his disciples following his resurrection when he says, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Thus, we perceive the true sense of the Pentecost. We come to the church. The divine service begins from the words, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Then we hear the words of absolution from the mouth of a priest. We hear the readings of the Holy Scripture. We hear the preaching of God's word. We partake of the divine gifts in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Here, through these concrete, earthly, physical acts of God, he performs, that he performs through his ministers, we experience the action of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives consolation to us and witnesses about Christ while Christ, in whom the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, reveals the Father to us. This is how we get to know the Holy Trinity, through relationships, from the Word and sacraments, as the means to the Holy Spirit 
to Christ, to God the Father. And Christ grants his peace to us, which is with us always, just as Christ is with us always, until the end of the age.